Hello and welcome to another InventRight TV show. My name is Andrew Krauss. I co-founded InventRight with Stephen Key over 21 years ago, and we've been in coaching and mentoring vendors to license their products ever since. We've had students in 65 countries. Sometimes it's Stephen or myself rambling, and sometimes we invite a very special guest. And today we have patent attorney Jake Ward. Welcome, Jake. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So people liked you so much on your other PPA show. I'm calling it a PPA show because we're doing nothing but questions <laughs> on PPAs. Um, and so I thought I'd have you back for another one. So I'm just going to jump right in because I'm all about information, giving great information. And I know you are as well. And by the way, guys, uh, Jake is a very inventor friendly patent attorney. He's a great guy. Steve and I have known him for a long time. Uh, first question is, this is a question we get all the time. Can can anyone see what I filed in my provisional patent application? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And the answer is no. Uh, provisional patent applications or PPAs, they're good for a period of one year. Um, and you have the patent pending status for the entirety of that year. The other nice fact, uh, facet of PPAs is they remain secret for that entire one year period. So unless you share the PPA document with a potential licensee or investor, there's no way anybody would be able to access that document at the patent office. That's huge. I mean, even when you file a full utility patent, not a provisional, you file a full utility, after 18 months, if it hasn't been granted, which it usually isn't, that goes public on what you filed. But a PPA is Correct. never shown and it only costs you 75 bucks. That's really cool. Correct. Keep, keep yeah, guessing. which is... Which is why, again, it's a great it's a great tool. It gives you all that all important patent pending status, which frees you up to go out there and do all those marketing activities, seeking your licenses, et cetera. And yes, it remains secret, meaning that no one can write on your coattails early in this in the patent process by trying to copy what what it is you've disclosed. So it's a great tool, um, especially early on in the inventing process. I even tell people sometimes we have students come on board and they're a little surprised when I say this, but when they know it's only seventy five bucks, they're like, okay, Andrew. They, they have an issued patent. And I'm like, okay, that's great. That can be an asset, but they can see exactly what you have. And if it's in a yeah. difficult industry, they could figure out a way around you. So I would, for 75 bucks, you've invested a lot in this patent. Maybe they made a prototype or something else. File a provisional as well for 75 bucks. So then you can say patented and patent pending. And you keep them guessing for 75 yeah. bucks. It's a great tool. Yeah, yeah, you're right, because even if you do have the patent on the base invention, just the nature of product development is you will make improvements. You will come up with additional ideas, changes, et cetera, and um, you can always file additional PPAs after the initial patent grants or even while it's still pending to cover those improvements. And, and you're absolutely right. When you ultimately get the product out onto the market, not only would it be marked with the patent number and the word patented, but it would also say and patent or patents pending, depending mm -hmm. on the case. But I like it that you keep the potential licensee guessing too. They might think you got another yeah. version in your back pocket or <laughs> other protection. Well, and, you know. And it goes back to, to what we describe patents as, Andrew. I mean, I always refer to them as fences. You're, you're, you're fencing off the property so you actually have something that you can lease or license in the IP yeah. context. And, and with these additional provisional or PPAs that you may be filing, not only would you have the scope of protection or the fence around the original concept, but you're also going to have these other pieces of property. And as with just any other form of property, real property included, the more property that you're licensing, probably the more value. Um, and so, I, I, yeah, I think additional PPAs as a strategy, especially if you are developing uh, the product and making improvements, make a ton of sense. I feel like I'm playing Monopoly or something. Got to get a yeah. lot of properties. <laughs> Park Place. Park, Park Place is yeah, the best. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I still don't know what is best. I need to look up, <laughs> you know, what's what's the ideal Monopoly strategy so when I play with my family, I can. <laughs> but my eight-year-old daughter already gets really upset when she doesn't win, so I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, so... Does the patent office, we get this question all the time, do they review? Are they going to approve my provisional patent? So what do you have to say to that? Well, you know, occasionally I'll, I'll see someone uh, who, who will say, oh, yes, the, the patent office approved my patent. And, and when you look at what paper it is that they are supplying as evidence of this, it's nothing but the filing receipt for the provisional application, which the patent office will normally mail about, about two to four weeks after you file. Um, what's important to know about provisional applications, Andrew, is it's they are simply placeholders. 
the patent office is not going to do any substantive review or examination of your provisional patent application papers. What they care about is, did you make the disclosure? Have you actually provided a written specification of the invention? And did you pay the fee? And did you fill out the forms correctly? So right. we actually know an, an inventor, you know, et cetera. Past that, the provisional just sits there. It's that placeholder, like I said, for a period of one year before you have to make the decision, do I want to start the examination process on my invention or it, not? It never, they never get rejected. The only time they get rejected is when you don't pay your fee, you don't include your address, you didn't follow right. instructions, but they're not reviewing or even reading the, the, the application itself or what you're trying Correct. to protect. You could scribble on a Correct. piece of paper with the crayon and they would accept it. Well, I, that's what I tell inventors all the time. It's like if you and I were to sit down across from each other at breakfast and you were to describe your invention to me on a napkin, I probably could file that napkin as a provisional patent application. Now, we, we don't like doing that for a whole myriad of, of reasons, sure. right? We, we, sure. we want to have a full and complete disclosure. More information is generally better than less. But the point is of that story is it's provisional applications are intended to be informal disclosures. They're a way of quickly lodging your invention with the patent office, obtaining that all important patent pending status, which frees you up to do your licensing marketing activities. Well, obviously we can't talk everything about uh, provisional patents, but for, for drawings or pictures, you know, there are no formal requirements, but what, what have you seen people do? What's acceptable and what do you recommend? Well, you know, in terms of what is acceptable, it's a very low bar for provisional applications. Um, I mentioned the, the, the napkin sketch uh, story a moment ago. You know, hand sketches can be supplied. Photographs of prototypes can be supplied in provisionals. If you have CAD, great, supply the CAD. Um, in terms of what should be supplied um, and what I recommend, I absolutely, if the invention lends itself to, to uh, drawings and design, I absolutely re recommend including drawings. Why? Drawings speak a thousand words, right? And that, that, that has never been so true as in the context of, of patents. And a good, a good set of drawings can really do tons for providing that sufficient disclosure for later on in examination in order for you to say, yes, I can use my earlier provisional filing date. So I don't recommend you, you, you go out and make CAD drawings, if you, if, if, if you haven't made them yet, it, you know, it really just depends on the context and how sufficient of a disclosure you have otherwise. Mm -hmm. and so even if, I mean, like, so one, one technique you can actually do is you can take a picture, uh, put it on a glass table, or you can tape it underneath the glass table, put a, another piece of paper on top of it and trace, you know, mm -hmm. and do that, that sort of thing. Um, there are no formal requirements. So that, that is correct. That is correct. And, and there's all sorts of tricks, right? Um, I mean, you can, you can do the tracing technique. Um, you know, I have, I have seen people who have taken, uh, you know, photographs from all the various angles. You can, you can do it in a professional setting, you know, with like a white background and all of that. Um, but ultimately, what matters is have you made a sufficient disclosure such that someone could pick up the document, including those drawings, who's familiar with your field, read it and say, yes, I know how to do what the inventor's saying here without mm -hmm. requiring too much guesswork or experimentation on their part. On, on the drawings and pictures thing, you could leave out words that talk about what your invention is and how it works and the functionality and utility of it. But you could have a picture that didn't talk about it, but later you could go, wait, no, no, I, it's there in the picture. Is that true? That is, that is true. If it is in there, then you have what is called support for any later argument, disclosure, claim amendment that you might make. Um, you know, I, like I said, you know, that's why I love drawings. I think if your invention lends itself to it, provide plenty of drawings, good drawings in your, in your application papers, whether it's provisional or the later non-provisional application, um, because those can provide and sometimes save the day um, uh, if you have to supply some form of support for a change or distinction relative to the prior art. At, at, at the same time, for us, we've never seen an inventor have to reference their provisional to protect their idea. Because it's only if that one year is an issue, right? They're going to look at the patent and see what's covered in the patent. And it's only if that one year is an issue. Or I guess if the attorney didn't bring something over from the provisional to the full utility, 
they could reference it then too. It, I guess. it does happen, you know, Andrew, and we talked about this in our, in our last interview, you know, it does happen um, occasionally where you need to prove that what you're claiming to be the invention actually was in that earlier provisional, because mm -hmm. if you can't get that earlier filing date, there's going to be some intervening prior art that could potentially be used against you. Um, so it does happen. It's a rarity though. My general advice for all PPAs, though, is more information is better than less. I mean, you don't want to skimp on the PPA uh, because you ultimately want to rely upon it for the filing date that it's giving you. And you can't do that if what you're claiming to be the invention a year from now is not actually in the provisional document at that at the outset. Yeah. So more information better than less. Tell me what you think of this. I always tell people because people worry about filing their provisional patent and I go, this is what I say. I say 80% of filing a good provisional is just being an inventor. Thinking about all the variations, workarounds, improvements, throwing them in there. You want to throw that version 70, 80, 90%, just as good, but not the version you're pitching. Don't throw one in there that's half as good because that's just wasting your time, right? Because that's yeah. not competition. Yeah. But be an inventor. And it's hard because the, the longer an inventor thinks about their product, the more fixed it becomes in their brain. This is what it is. This is what it is. But when you file that provision, you go, well, what could it be? Can I knock myself off? How else could I do it? And then throw it all in there. Is that good advice? That That is good advice because – there's too often, I think, the tendency for someone who's never written a patent application before to, to just say, all right, this is my invention. And it's these two blocks, you know, connected with with this particular adhesive. And that's what the invention is. And mm -hmm. the invention is not just the product. It's it's the concept. The product embodies the invention. But but in that particular case, well, maybe I don't want to use an adhesive. Maybe I could use a different mechanical faster, like a screw or a bolt or something along those lines and mm -hmm. forcing yourself both as the inventor and also as the attorney who's helping the inventor to think about these alternatives ultimately makes for a much more robust patent application yeah. and, and ultimately a much more robust patent. Um, and so I think it's a good exercise when, in fact, one of my, one of my top pieces of advice I give inventors early on is to sit down and document what your invention is before you even get to the point where you talk with a, a, a patent attorney. Um, about it because the act of writing down about what your invention is will force you to think critically about it and it'll help you to sort of come up with those workarounds like you were mentioning a moment mm -hmm. ago and then you can make sure you document those and that all part comes in as part of the patent application in, in that well, same vein if somebody comes to you and they go well, here's my widget right and they don't say here's my widget and all the variations and workarounds and improvements like they should do you do you go that's great can you get me that information so I can do a better job? Because some uh, inventors, they think it's the attorney's job and the attorney's job is not to be the inventor uh, and think about all those variations. Where, and they, I think a lot of inventors think it is. And so how do you deal with that? And how do you see other attorneys dealing with it? I think, I think patent attorneys have an interesting role in this process. Um, and, and you're right. You know, the patent attorney should not be the inventor. Um, but I think a good patent attorney will help you to think critically about these different variations, especially when we talk about the claims, which, as you know, for a provisional patent application, there's not even a requirement for claims. But we all, almost always will include at least some claims, which are the legal definition of the invention, in the provisional patent application papers. And one of the reasons why is exactly what we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. We're trying to break it down into what is the most basic, broadest invention here. So maybe we're not using you know, a screw in this location to hold the pieces together. We'll just say it's a fastener. And we could say other, other mechanical fasteners could also be used. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, there is also this, this collaboration and that any good patent attorney will have with an inventor and vice versa. There's going to be some back and forth. We're going to talk about what the invention is. We're going to talk about those potential well, design arounds. You, and that should ultimately find its way into the patent application. Yeah, I think you use that word, any good patent attorney will do that. <laughs> because yeah. you, I've seen, and I'm sure you have seen some patents yeah. that are just ludicrous. And yeah. it's obvious the patent attorney did not push the inventor to do that. And it's just the protection is weak to non-existent, yeah. you know? So yeah. uh, I, I do, I do sometimes describe the relationship. And, and again, maybe it's just my own experience, you know, working with a good patent attorney, the relationship between an inventor and a patent attorney up front, when you're, when the inventor is trying to find a patent attorney, it's sort of like dating. You know, this is a person you are going to be in, in a relationship with for the long term. 
because you just don't file a patent application, as you know. Andrew, I'm going to tell a joke. Yeah, yeah, it's, go ahead. it's like dating, but it's like it's like you're a teenager and it's your first date and you have <laughs> no idea to what to look for in a girlfriend or boyfriend. And yeah. you're a little clueless and you might make a really bad decision. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on the part of the inventor, they don't know what they're looking for in yeah. an attorney, I think, most of the time. You know, one of the one of the top things I can recommend, you yeah. know, because I, I I hear what you're saying that you know there are some poor attorneys out there, and I think that's that goes with any occupation. There's sure. a bell curve, right? Of course. Um, but by and large, the majority of patent attorneys um, are going to be pretty good. Um, they are people who, because of the nature of how we get to this role in the process, we have to take you know multiple bars. We have to you know have certain degrees. Most of the really poor individuals, I think, get weeded out as part of the process. So my advice to most most clients, most inventors, is speak with a couple attorneys. Ultimately, you know, work with the one that you feel the most comfortable with. You know, because again, it is going to be a long term relationship. You're you're not only going to be working with this person for the next three or four years, you know, which is what it might take to actually get the patent in hand. This person is going to be someone you're going to know for the next twenty some years because mm. patents last that long yeah. and there are maintenance fees. And so I, I count among some of my best friends, clients who I've known for 20 years, you know, but wow. it's because we have that long-term relationship that's sort of built into the practice. Yeah. That's, anyway, that's kind of a beautiful thing. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Anyways, uh, that, that's my advice. You know, interview a couple of attorneys, deal with the one that you feel the most comfortable with and then, and then trust that, yes, because they've gone through the, the gauntlet, they're going to be competent and will be able to do what they need to do. Well, Jake, thank you so much for coming back on another show. That was great information. Um, our, our audience has endless questions about PPA, so you definitely are helping out there. Really appreciate it. And I remind everybody to take care and keep inventing, and we'll catch you the next time. See you guys. Bye.